This is part two of this three-part series on the Phytophthora root rots in California native plants. And in this section, we're going to talk about how landscapes become infected. What is what are the processes involved in that? I use this image of a Phytophthora uh, cinnamomy root disease center to illustrate how invasion of a plant community occurs from Phytophthora. We have an initial introduction from the source. I will indicate that it occurred at this point. Movement then occurs both cross slope and down slope, as well as back up slope, uh, cross slope and down slope, uh, and up slope directions all can occur by means of, of root to root spread. Additionally, down slope, you can also have movement that is involved with, with soil and plant material that is washed down through surface flows. Beyond that, when soil and, and root material and plant debris are moved from one spot to another, that may be by the action of people, equipment, animals, some combination, we can spread new disease foci to both within the generally infested area and beyond that where it forms new infested areas. This and other transects were set up in Ion Manzanita habitat to look at the rates of spread we start with the disease front right along here and follow that over time. And you can see within 10 years, the disease front now is well beyond this five meter mark. And we've had on average across multiple transects a, a rate of spread in root to root on the order of a meter per year on the level or uphill. If we're looking at downhill spread, that can occur quicker because there is also this effect of of overland flow, especially in an erodible site like this, where you have a lot of bare soil that can be washed down in heavy rainfall. We have surface runoff like we have in this ditch following uh, rain, or in larger bodies of water, we can have zoospores of Phytophthora move long distances. This is just a little bit of surface runoff that lasted for a short period of time, but we were able to sample this and find zoospores of Phytophthora and Cryptogea and Cambivora using baiting, showing how easily even a short duration of, of flooding can, can move zoospores down great distances. Phytophthora inoculum soil lasts for a long time. Uh, once we have a plant that's killed, there are various types of resistant spores that can persist in the soil. So many of these areas don't regenerate with the susceptible species because they're killed by the residual inoculum. So these dead seedlings are seedlings that came up, encountered inoculum, then eventually die. The process now we're looking at is that we have inoculum of some sort that's introduced at a spot and from there it can spread. So in the case of the Hukuiku Trail here we talked about in part one, inoculum was most likely introduced somewhere along the trail associated with trail work or from trail user of some sort. It then moved upwards and it killed vegetation above the trail. It also moved downwards, killing vegetation downslope. And the downslope movement is greater because it can also be assisted by runoff from the surface that can carry inoculum downslope. At China Camp State Park, we have a similar situation going on here. Uh, the introduction most likely occurred of along this fire road here, which was used to access the upper parts of the park where some eucalyptus removal had been done in years in the past. Apparently this is where inoculum was introduced and then spread primarily downhill from this point. At this site in the Myakimus Mountains, Phytophthora cambivora was associated with manzanita mortality in a number of sites where grading or excavation had occurred, and that was apparently the source of soil movement. This piece of equipment actually sitting on the site there shows how much soil can be found in things like treads and as well as in other parts of equipment like this. It can move an infestation from one location to another. In the Ion Manzanita areas, there are some widespread infestations that are associated with the use of uh, off-road vehicles. And you can see all the road areas in here. And these areas highlighted are very heavily infested with but the question is, we can move soil that's infested from one area to another, but how's the soil getting infested in the first place? And in many cases, 
the answer is really right in front of us. Um, in this particular site, we're seeing a restoration site where nursery stock of Ceanothus was planted into habitat directly. It is well established that nursery stock is commonly infected with Phytophthora when it's grown under conventional situations, such as you see in this nursery. Starting back in mid 20th century and continuing to current time, you can see that there have been many, many different studies that document the amount of infestation that occurs in these nurseries. And one of these later ones, Young 2016, really summarizes the situation for Europe where they said that there is very ubiquitous infestation by many Phytophthora species throughout these nursery stands. And that's the same situation that exists in the U.S. We have over time seen an increasingly wide variety of Phytophthora species been working their way into nurseries and then working their way back out through outplanted nursery stock. And unfortunately, there's no evidence that there's been any kind of firewall between ornamental plant nurseries and native plant nurseries. And as a result, we have a wide variety of Phytophthora species that have also been detected in native plant nurseries in California, as we see in this particular reference. So why is Phytophthora so common in nursery? Well, it goes back to the idea of the plant disease triangle, or we can expand it to the plant disease pyramid. We have an interaction between a host pathogen and the environment, which has both abiotic and biotic components interacting over time to, to cause disease. In the case of Phytophthora, Favorable abiotic conditions include moisture and well aerated soil, periodic saturation, moderate temperatures. Those are all conditions we find in nurseries on a regular basis. For the host, we want a high host density and high root density if we're going to infect from one root to the other very readily. And if we have various predisposing stresses, that also tends to increase the, the chances of infection because the host becomes more susceptible. Again, between high root density, high host density, and these stresses very common in nursery environments. Biotic influences are usually antagonistic to Phytophthora, but in these simplified nursery systems, we just really don't have effective antagonists. And so when we take material and we grow it for a longer period of time, we have very high probability of having Phytophthora infestation in the stock. In nurseries, we have densely stocked areas where plants are placed in very dense arrays to save space. In many cases, conventional nurseries put these on the ground or very low racks where there's potential soil contamination. These arrays are of usually uniform monoculture types of varieties, and there's a high chance of contagion. In many ways, the contagion risk is similar to what we would see in something like this, this poultry house here. Um, and if we have a, a an, infectious agent that can attack the, the either the crop or the flock in the case of this picture we can quickly have it spread throughout the entire array. The other issue we have is that in nursery conditions our infected plants are often symptomless carriers. You have three plants here and you might wonder if one or any of these were infected with Phytophthora and I can save you guessing by showing you that all three of them are actually quite heavily infected. And in fact, the uh, one on the right, which was the largest of the three plants, has an almost completely rotted root system. With these drought tolerant plants we have, in, especially California natives, they can look good on the top, even though their root systems are heavily decayed. That means you're not gonna spot infected plants just by looking at them. And that period, they can continue to spread inoculum within the flock. So I've heard this many times, and I'm sure you have too. These plants died because they got too wet. They had wet feet, they been overwatered, or they got Phytophthora because too much moisture. And the thing to remember, of course, that Phytophthora is, is a pathogen. and You don't get Phytophthora root disease unless the pathogen is present. So no matter how much water you put on something, it's not going to get disease with Phytophthora unless Phytophthora is present. As we go back to the concept of plant disease, pyramid, that pathogen has to be present there. Water and abundance is a favorable condition to favor disease development, but it isn't the cause. This slide illustrates the point we're trying to make. We have an island manzanita seedlings growing in these little 
cups here. They've all been flooded twice for 24 hours, 12 days apart. And you can see that half of these plants are dead, the other half are alive. And the difference between these two halves is that the, the live ones were not inoculated, they're growing in sterile soil, whereas those that all died were inoculated with Phytophthora cinnamomid zoospores. So the flooding is not the issue in these plants, it's the presence of a pathogen that when combined with the flooding kills the plants. So when contaminated nursery stock is planted near existing vegetation, Phytophthora can over time spread by means of of root to root contact or through overland flow into that surrounding vegetation. You see in this home site we have a declining bay tree to the right and two nearly dead madrones further to the left associated with the Phytophthora cinnamomi that was introduced with landscaping stock. In this location we have spread from landscaping plants but they're from adjacent properties. If we look along the ridge here we can see above the preserve there are these planted residential properties, and down below is where we find this mortality center from P. cinnamomi. And all along this ridge, which drains downhill, we find that we have vegetation, planted vegetation along all these homes, and we have Phytophthora as shown by these red balloons all along this, below this ridge, we have Phytophthora cinnamomi infestations in this area. At this location, the PUC Peninsula Watershed, uh, we were surveying for Phytophthora. Were we finding many of them along the roads? We also found this cluster of uh, multi-species in this one area. The areas of interest is right here, but areas around it that contribute to the fact that we have this multi-species infestation is the fact that we're near the historic Bololi estate very landscape area with its own nursery, this smaller red circle, and a caretaker's house, uh, the white circle, and travel along this road between those areas, the contamination it was, has evidently been spread over the course of many years infesting this forest. forest. This site located near the Anderson Dam is a site where we could document pretty clearly that nursery stock that was infected was the source of a Phytophthora infestation along a wide area. Here are some endangered uh, Cyanosa species, Cyanosa brisii. We also had toyons uh, and a number of other woody species, Sambucas, uh, semi-woody things like Artemisia californica that were dying in various places. We've done quite a bit of sampling at this Anderson Dam site. These dots that are shown on the map are Phytophthora samples points, the red ones are positive detections, the white ones are negatives. And you see on this particular slope uh, to the left of the dam, there's quite a few positive Phytophthoras, and in fact, they represent a, not a single species, but six different species at least, been found in this area on a variety of different plant material. What explains this diversity of, of Phytophthora and the density of it is the fact that at these sites shown, a number of uh, nursery grown plants were put in about 23 years earlier, and they've ended up infesting over seven acres down the slope. As you can see that as we get away from, the, from that particular area, we don't actually have detections up in these uplands around the area. So pretty clear that it spread from these particular plants. We also have a very high infection rate amongst those samples that we sampled. Of course, we are sampling pretty much symptomatic plants. We did see this one site along the trail to the right where P. crassimura was detected, and we do think there's a good chance that that was brought in by trail use from another site. So here's a restoration site that uh, was put in in around 2014, and we received this plant from that planting and found that it actually had a couple of Phytophthora species associated with this rotted root system. One of those was Phytophthora tentaculata, which had only once before been detected in California in a nursery and had not since then been uh, detected again. Well, that set into motion a number of things. Among the things that happened is we went and sampled what plant materials had not been planted and there hadn't been a lot that had not already gone out to these sites. We were able to find Phytophthora 
here in these coast live oaks. We also found some uh, Phytophthora in, in a species we didn't really think was even going to be a host. These carrots, oh, these failed ones had Phytophthora pleurivora. There was also a lot of testing that was initiated on the material that we planted. In this material, we were detecting Phytophthora, such as this Phytophthora cactorum and this planted Quercus lobata. This map shows samples taken at just one of these large restoration sites. You can see many samples were taken to try to determine how common Phytophthora infestation was throughout the plantings and in what species these were located. The sampling is fairly intensive, required digging up planting sites, uh, then baiting and isolating from the baits and sending those back to the lab to be uh, sequenced to determine the Phytophthora species. Overall, across all the uh, restoration sites that were sampled under this particular project, there were at least 22 Phytophthora taxa. Some of these were hybrids. Uh, one of these taxon, Agrifolia, is a not undescribed species. This is a lot of a lot of Phytophthora to be picking up associated from nurseries that contributed, which only numbered about a half a dozen or so. So we can see that these individual nurseries actually had had multiple Phytophthora species in, and when we mixed these nurseries together and planted them out, we ended up with quite a stew of Phytophthora. To see kind of a micro example that just in three planted seedlings from this area of one of these restoration sites, we had four different serious Phytophthora species, including Phytophthora cinnamomi and Campivora, Cryptogea, and this previously undescribed species, Taxon agrifolia. Beyond that, area. We've also, various other agencies were concerned about the, the infestations with their previous planting, so we started sampling these other areas. Here's a mimulus with uh, a mimulus plant that had two different species of Phytophthora associated that had been planted a few years earlier. Uh, this were some recent plantings actually not far from where I live, uh, sampling just uh, two plants and having three species of Phytophthora found on them. This was a particularly problematic site managed by the Santa Clara Valley Water District, a uh, restoration planting up on a, on a site had to serve as an assisted migration for an uh, endangered species where habitat was being removed elsewhere. This whole planting turned out to be heavily infested with Phytophthora cactorum. Uh, the plants were dying and because of the heavy level of infestation, it was necessary to remove all of these plants to try to salvage this area. To get a better handle on what was going on at their various past restoration sites, Santa Clara Valley Water District worked with us and with the Rizzo Lab from UC Davis, uh, particularly Tyler Beret and Heather Mel showing this image, to sample previous restoration sites that had some various risk factors associated with them and that had issues. This uh, long list of Phytophthora species shown here uh, really 38 taxa, some of them previously undescribed, others of them, like uh, P. quercina, uh, happened to be the first U.S. record of this particular pathogen. They were found on a wide variety of native species, 28 native plant species, and clearly indicated that we had high levels of past uh, infestation. This planted nursery stock doesn't necessarily just die and go away. And in, all, in sampling we did, as well as the Rizzo Lab, we could look at older plantings and find that Phytophthora were associated with plant material that was still declining and dying after many different many years, in, indicating that it, these pathogens became established well enough for those sites to survive and continue to affect the plants for an extended period of time. This was the case in the uh, Phytophthora porcina site which had been uh, planted 14 years before we actually sampled it. The plants here were not dead. They were Quercus lobata that were severely stunted relative to where they should be if they were planted 14 years previously. We isolated Phytophthora quercina from a number of these different plants. The problem with plants surviving with Phytophthora is that they have the potential to continue to shed inoculum, contribute to the local environment, and infest other plants. We not only sampled in northern California sites, but with some projects uh, 
with the Angeles National Forest. We also went and sampled in some much drier Southern California locations with kind of similar results. When we're looking at restoration plantings from nursery stock that was grown under conditions that was favor Phytophthora, we did find that it had been translocated to the field and we could still recover it. These plants in, were in very dry conditions. There was some irrigation at most of these sites to establish the plants, but the plants were failing due to the presence of Phytophthora. And some of these were Phytophthoras that have not previously been described as well. At this site in particular, we have the issue where we were, there were uh, native scrub oaks that were planted in this area. Uh, Quercus John Tuckeri. We did find Phytophthora cactorum on these plants, and these happen to be just a short distance upslope from these native Quercus John Tuckeri. So there's the potential over time for the inoculum that was transferred to the field to be spread into these this other native vegetation, essentially undoing the whole concept of trying to restore these sites. To summarize, we have a large number of research activities that have been conducted over the last few years that really demonstrate how conventional nursery stock used for habitat restoration has been a primary source of contamination of many sites. Over 60 Phytophthora species and multiple undes previously undescribed Phytophthora species have been detected on a wide variety of plant species. Over 50 have been wet to relatively dry sites in both northern and Southern California. So we have a lot of different situations where this can occur, a lot of potential impact, especially because with the pathogen diversity, there's more possibility of, of damage to existing species out there. Each phytophthora that's introduced has its own host range. Some of these are overlapping, some of these expand the total range. So the more there are, the more damage is potentially caused. So that ends this part of the presentation. Again, I want to thank the cooperators and funding agencies that provided funding for this work.